Hi, and welcome to this Fairy Tale Friday feature where I'm going to dive into The Wizard of Oz. What does The Wizard of Oz tell us about ourselves, our human nature, and our capacity to transform our lives? Now, the thing is, just a week ago, I had no idea, but I had an epiphany. And it, when the first idea came to me of what the story is really about, it just all unfolded like that brilliant yellow brick road. And it's so awesome. I really couldn't wait to share it with you. So for those of you who aren't familiar with The Wizard of Oz, here's a quick synopsis. You have Dorothy, who is an orphan, who lives with her aunt and uncle on a farm in Kansas. She's lost. She doesn't feel at home on the farm. The only person she has a really deep connection with is her dog, Toto. She's impulsive. She loses her temper very easily. So one day she runs away and she meets up with a traveling magician. But he actually tricks her to go back home by making her feel guilty for running away and you know, emotionally hurting her aunt. And then on her way home, a tornado strikes and sweeps up the house just as she arrives back and takes her on to a journey to the land of Oz. When the house lands, it happens to fall upon a witch and kills the Wicked Witch of the East. Ding dong, the witch is dead, for those of you who know the movie. Anyway, the Munchkins, who are the people living in this part of Oz, are incredibly happy because the witch made life hell for them. And then the good witch of the North, called Glinda, gives Dorothy the dead witch's ruby slippers and sends Dorothy on a quest to the Emerald City to see if the Wizard of Oz can help Dorothy go home. The dead witch's sister, the Wicked Witch of the West, wants revenge and she wants those ruby slippers because there's something very special about them, but you don't really know what that is. So on her travels along the yellow brick road towards the Emerald City, Dorothy meets a scarecrow who wants a brain, a tin woodsman who wants a heart, and a cowardly lion who wants to find his bravery. Together they seek out the wizard in the Emerald City, but the wizards decline their petition and says he'll only consider their wishes if they kill the Wicked Witch of the West. So after struggling and getting captured and having a great big adventure, Dorothy eventually succeeds in this task when she accidentally melts the witch. The Wizard of Oz turns out to be a fraud. He's not a real wizard and doesn't have any magic. He uses tricks, but he is very inventive. And he recognizes, for example, that the scarecrow is intelligent. So he doesn't need a brain, he needs a diploma. The Tin Woodsman is good and kind and is much better off than having a real heart. So he gets a recognition. And the Cowardly Lion is also recognized for doing things even when he's afraid. And then the wizard offers to take Dorothy back to the real world on his balloon. But in the last moment, Toto runs away. And Dorothy is stranded in Oz because the, the Wizard of Oz left without her. And that's then the moment when the good witch, Glinda, returns, consoles Dorothy, and explains that the ruby slippers actually have the power to send her home. So she's always had the possibility to achieve her wish, but she needed to learn to believe in that power first. And then Dorothy returns home, and that's the end of the story. Now, what does Frank L. Baum's fantastical fable really tell us? I'm going to actually just go into a general overview of the symbolism that I've identified in the story and how it applies to us humans. I'm going to draw a lot on the imagery from the movie. 
if you've seen the movie, it's very clear that Dorothy dreams her adventure in the land of Oz. And this is the first hint because it signifies a journey within instead of traveling somewhere. So Dorothy isn't actually going anywhere. She's going into her deepest self. And the story is about her discovering herself. What I came to realize recently when I was thinking about The Wizard of Oz is, and this is the thing that's really brilliant about it, is that the whole story is built on the ancient wisdom that draws on truths our subconscious actually knows. And that's why the story works so well and really resonates with us. It's why the story sticks with us so well. Okay, so let's start with the very easy element, the Emerald City. Green is the color of the heart chakra. Okay, if you know ancient Indian traditions, the, the body has seven centers of energy. And the one that represents the heart, the color associated with that is green. So the Emerald City color is green. Okay, and the Emerald City lies at the heart of the land of Oz. The heart chakra is associated with our creativity and our ingenuity, and it's the wellspring of our desires and longings. Last time, when I did a session on fairy tales and transformation principles, I looked at Aladdin and how we need to be careful for what we wish for. Now, the Emerald City, or in this case, our hearts, are our very own cave of wonders where we can explore and embrace the wonders and marvels of our imagination and combine that with our heart's desire to make our wish for a life we would love come true. Now that brings us to imagination and that's the land of Oz. It's a place filled with fantastical things and as long as we can imagine it, it exists in the land of Oz. But we need to bring the dreams to the Emerald City to be able to manifest them in our real lives. I.e., we need to, we, we really need to make it a part of ourselves and create it within the space of our heart in the Emerald City. What the story is saying is that we need to align our imagination with the longing in our hearts to be able to create what it is that we would love to experience. Now, how do you do that? How do you find the Emerald City? that one small speck that is the perfect place where everything aligns in the great big land of Oz. Because I mean, your imagination is filled with so much stuff. <laughs> How do you find the Emerald City? How do you find the thing that you really want to do? And how do we explore exactly what we must do to achieve that one thing? By following the yellow brick road, of course. Your intuition is the key to finding your place where everything aligns. Now, I love the visual that they give us in the Wizard of Oz movie in Munchkinland when Dorothy sets off because she starts on that tiny central speck and then follows the yellow brick road, which starts off small and keeps growing bigger and bigger and it gets wider as she travels until it's this huge thoroughfare just before she arrives at the Emerald City. And that's such a brilliant visualization of how our intuition works. Because at first, when you spend years and years ignoring your intuition or claiming that your dreams are impossible and pushing them away, your intuition is nothing more than a tiny little speck. It's just a spark. But once you start listening and actually following your very own yellow brick road, it starts to grow. And the more you listen to your intuition, the more often you'll hear it. And the more powerful and insistent your intuition becomes. The more focus you place on following your heart, the easier it becomes and the easier it is to navigate both your inner and outer worlds. When you follow the yellow brick road, it becomes increasingly easier to distinguish which of the things you imagine are actually going to get you closer to your heart's desire. So you can follow those and leave behind the other fancy ideas that won't get you any further. But there's, there's one more thing to take into account with the land of Oz. The tricky thing with the imagination is it isn't all good. 
Our land of Oz is populated with good witches who fill us with wonderful ideas on what's possible and what we'd love to achieve. But it's also populated by bad witches who fill us with doubt and fear. Our Emerald City is home to the Wizard of Oz, our ingenuity that is as strong or even stronger than the dark magic of our fears and doubts. When we know what we want and we are in alignment with achieving that desire, then we have the power to overcome the wicked witches of our inner land of Oz. And we can do this in the most unexpected and ingenious ways. Have you ever experienced how these huge obstacles that were just insurmountable and you didn't know how you were going to get and achieve your dream just vanish miraculously, they just dissolve. And suddenly you achieve something far faster than you ever believed possible. It's like a miracle. Our doubts and fears are the obstacles in our path. They make us lose our way. They sabotage us in our attempts to find our perfect alignment. And they even keep us trapped in dark castles, stopping us from achieving our dreams. They eat away at the goodness and fill us with dark thoughts and foreboding. But when we are aligned with our purpose, when we found the Emerald City, and we combine our desires with our imagination and allow our ingenuity to work, those obstacles just melt away. Learning to follow your intuition and overcome your doubts and fears are key lessons in the life coaching course that I teach. And they are tightly linked to meditation or going into your own inner world to discover yourself and create the life you long to experience. The Wizard of Oz really offers a blueprint for that inner journey you have to take to define and follow your dreams so you can eventually achieve it successfully in the real world. As we discussed in the previous section of this analysis, uh, there is quite a lot to the Wizard of Oz that we maybe haven't seen before. I really love about how this is all envisioned is that with just the simplest decision to pour water on a wicked witch, our fears can melt away. And that is a very lovely symbol because they really can just melt away. Our fears, our doubts, our negative self-talk, when we actually pinpoint it and go, hang on, that's not the truth. That's just those negative thoughts. That's just my limiting self-beliefs talking back to me. I don't have to listen to this. And they do just melt away, disappear in a puff of smoke. It's pretty awesome when it happens. Of course, they come back. They're not gone for good. But once we've noticed them, they're easier to get rid of over and over again. So I had mentioned that the Emerald City represents the heart chakra in the Vedic understanding of chakras. And this brings us back to the yellow brick road because the yellow chakra is the solar plexus chakra. And that one governs our stomach and our intestines. It's the functioning of our bodies and it's also representative of our egos and who we are our, our sense of identity so this is again another really interesting symbolic image that we're given in the wizard of oz but one thing that they have in the movie that continues on this path which is not in the book are the ruby slippers because in Frank Baum's book, they are silver slippers, not ruby slippers. While in the movie, so someone on that movie set was really in tune and wanted to do this visual representation. And they got the symbolism so right that it stuck with us forever. And the thing is, the ruby slippers represent the root chakra which is the first one right at the base of our spine. And what I found so very interesting is that the root chakra is what grounds us. 
it's the thing that keeps us tethered to our sense of self. And if you know meditation and have done grounding exercises, you will definitely recognize the strength and the importance of grounding. And what I find so fascinating is that Dorothy is a lost soul. She's an orphan. She doesn't know who she is. She's struggling to find her way home. She doesn't know where home is. And when you then look at that final scene in the movie where she's standing in Oz, the Wizard of Oz has just flown off with his balloon and she's stuck in Oz and the good fairy or the good witch Glinda comes back and says to Dorothy, well, you've had the power to go home all this time, but you didn't have the faith or the belief to be able to do it. And it's all rests in those ruby slippers. Well, it's a fact that she's learned more about herself. She's come to understand herself. And so Dorothy can find her way home by trusting in her roots, by trusting in her ruby slippers by grounding herself in her identity, in who she is. She's learned more about herself by following the yellow brick road, by reaching the Emerald City and listening to her heart. And so then she can use her route, she can use her ruby slippers to take her home. And that's such a brilliant, brilliant way of seeing our lives because when we're lost, when we're confused, when we don't know who we are, and we're fighting against this wave after wave of life and the things that life throws at us. But if we take a moment to stop and to think and to go in, inwards and to find ourselves, then the miracle is that then we know where home is and there's no place like home. wonderful to be here yes well thank you and for those of you who don't know us i would like to introduce you to my mother anne Fogel, who is an inspiration in my life and has totally totally helped me along the way of finding the symbolism in things and stories so thank you for joining me and i'm really really excited about this because we've loved the wizard of oz for so long <laughs> And this is so much fun. It is. It's absolutely fun. And I think we're going to have a lot of fun this evening. And uh, yeah, I must just say that symbolism, I think you had some really inspiring English teachers as well in your school career. That I did. And your uni yeah, and in, at uni as well. You did English yeah. at uni, didn't you? Yes, I did. Um, English literature. Uh, three years of it. it was it was very eye-opening actually and it's, it's quite curious because what I found so fascinating was that one day in my anthropology class one of my lecturers asked you know what other subjects are you studying and then she linked them to anthropology and so I mentioned English and she said oh yeah well absolutely because English literature is just another form of anthropological fieldwork. <laughs> it's... Yeah, it's cultural expression. Precisely. So how, how does that relate to The Wizard of Oz? Well, let's just take a look at when Frank Baum wrote his book at the turn of the century in 1900. And if you look at those, those opening lines of The Wizard of Oz, that everything is gray, you know, gray Kansas and and um, Aunt M is, is, you know, so careworn and her skin is gray and her hair is gray and her clothes are gray. It really gives you an insight in what life was like. It was hard. City life was really hard. Uh, there were no, you know, working conditions and unions and rights. You know, in, in Sweden, at least at that time, there, there was no universal voting right at the time. And certainly women didn't have the vote in most countries of the world at that time. At that time, exactly. So 
at that very early beginning of just representing the hardships of life with grayness, you know, the, the drudgery, the, you know, you get up in the morning, you go to work, you do what you have to do, and then you, you know, you eat and you fall into bed and you're exhausted all the time. And I definitely recognize that grayness in modern life. And when you're not following your passion and not listening to your intuition and not experiencing the land of imagination, it's all gray. It really is. It's also an interesting thought that if our inner environment is gray, then we're also mm. out of touch with our, our bodies. Mm. And so we don't see the color and the detail of our sensations, our inner sensation. Yeah. Which is relating back to what you mentioned in last week about the green, the emerald being the heart, the green chagra, and um, the ruby slippers being red. I know in the book, in the original version, they are silver, yeah. as you mentioned, <laughs> but uh, in, in the movie, the, the, was it 2016 movie? Was it older that than one that? Too, but, the, but the 1939 movie with, with Judy Garland there was ruby slippers, slippers as well. Yes. Okay. Ah, that makes, that's really interesting. That's it almost is. as if it was intuitive rather than yeah. conscious. Absolutely. I definitely get that feeling that someone on that set said, look, silver slippers are just not going to be visible on, on screen. And red is just so powerful in this massive, the color was so important because yeah. from the movies, it was one of the first color movies ever produced. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so they, they really put color in. Yeah. And so then intuitively they picked the right color. It's brilliant. <laughs> just, just goes to show that Jung was right about the collective unconscious. The, the people on the set working on the Wizard of Oz in 1939 were clearly in tune with the symbolism, which fits into what Jung theorized, essentially. Right, right. And what I found is that all fairy tales, all of those really, the, those fairy tales that, that grab us viscerally and that we, we remember through, through time, those are the ones that tap into the collective unconscious. Wow, and that's actually quite an insight um, because just quickly thinking through a lot of fairy tales, that just stands out for me. Mm -hmm. That, yes, and um, also some of the sort of older Greek and Roman mythology, yeah. mythological tales uh, as well. Absolutely. So getting back to those ruby slippers and you were saying about red, the earth chakra and grounding and how when one is grounded, one is then in connection with oneself. Yeah. And it was through that connection that Dorothy was able to then make her way home again, to find her way home. Yeah. Um, what was the role of the Wicked Witch? Well, she has, there are several roles. I think one of the most important ones in terms of the story is the fear. She incites fear in the movie. Because if we think about the actual book, she doesn't feature until Dorothy is sent by the Wizard of Oz to go and defeat the Wicked Witch of the West. While in the, in the movie, the Wicked Witch is there all the time and she's constantly sabotaging Dorothy's attempts to get to the Emerald City. And this is how our fears work. They sabotage us. They stop us from finding our passion or going after the things that we are passionate about. Our, our doubts and our fears keep us caged and afraid of doing things or I have that thing of what's the point anyway there's no point in doing it because it's not going to work and that's kind yes, of so keeping us stuck yes. keeping us stuck 
exactly. So when Dorothy starts on her journey, she's following the yellow brick road, which is her intuition. Yes. But she is moving forwards with her intuition. So that's actually quite a powerful image. It is. And there's also the fact that even when you're on the right path, doubts and fears can still sabotage you. And they can get you off the path if you're not careful. So like the situation with Dorothy ending up in the field of poppies and falling asleep in the field of poppies and being threatened with an eternal slumber there. And it takes her friends to help yes. her out, which again is yet another really important message there because we need our our biggest fans, our supporters who help us through everything to help us block our negative self-talk. It's also interesting because the Tin Woodman and the lion, the cowardly lion, Tin Woodman has no heart or believes he has no heart. Mm -hmm. But it, he is not heartless. That is yeah. his his power. Yeah. Um, and the the scarecrow thinks he is dumb, but he makes the because he has no brain. But he makes all the most critical decisions. And then the lion is uh, is vulnerable, but he's yeah. not. But he's not lacking in courage. It's actually quite interesting. Yeah. Exactly. He, he's. Even in the book, he, he has that characteristic of he's, he's afraid of things and he acknowledges his fear. But when push comes to shove, when you get into that crunch situation, he's there for you. You know, he's, he's there and he'll help. And he'll yes, in other words, that is what courage is. Yeah. Courage is knowing your fear and stepping into it to overcome it. Come it. Absolutely. So what is the role of the Wizard of Oz? What is his symbolism? And why does he come out at the end as being a fraud, a humbug, somebody yeah. who's not authentic? Right. I'm not entirely sure how that is in the original book, but definitely in the, in the movie, he's very definitely represented as, as a fraud, as a... Yes. And at first... My first instinct is to classify him as ingen ingenuity because he resides in the Emerald City, which is the place, our heart is our place of creation and it's where our ingenuity comes from. And this is the thing, I mean, he has all his gadgets, he has his whole setup so that people don't realize that the little man in the corner behind the, 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 curtain is the wizard of oz they think it's the the big light show going on the, on the stage and th this is the thing i mean we are very inventive people we have this creative ability to be inventive and to overcome the most incredible obstacles but we have to allow that to flow and we have to acknowledge that you know sometimes it feels a little bit like being a fraud if you think about jordan peterson for example says that you have to stand up straight with your shoulders back and that tells your brain on an intuitive level that you are confident and it just gives you the right uh, brain chemistry to feel confident just by standing up straight with your shoulders back and that's to a certain extent is where our inventiveness is at it's it's sort of tricking ourselves into believing that we know what we're doing, but we don't really. I mean, it takes, you know, they, they, we muddle along. We don't really know what we're doing. But our inventiveness, and especially when it's in harmony with our intuition, is actually very powerful, which makes it the, the Wizard of Oz. It's, that's the, the king of the land. You know, he's the ruler of all of Oz, the most wonderful wizard that ever there was. Right. Now let's pause for a moment because that's, that's actually very, very powerful. I believe that the Wizard of Oz is the ego. There is that aspect to him too, absolutely. Can you elaborate a little on that? Well, our ego is actually a really essential part of who we are. 
but it's also the tends to be the seat of our false self mm. and an ego out of balance mm. is that great big powerful wizard mm. but it's not authentic it's not the authentic self and in fact the humble man who had the air balloon the hot air balloon yeah take him away the the humble and and um, kindly person behind that ego is is actually the true ego the ego in balance as opposed to an ego that's out of balance right and that that's also very interesting because the ego out of balance sent dorothy on an impossible mission to kill the wicked witch of the west and the ego in balance acknowledged the scarecrow for his intelligence despite not having a brain and gave him his diploma the ego in balance recognized the kindness in the tin woodman and gave him the symbol of his heart and also gave the badge of courage to the lion which is again you know thinking out of the box yes you might not have a brain but you you have shown intelligence so let's find a way to represent that or acknowledge it yes now what about dorothy if if the this um this authenticity around kindness and mm. and courage and um and intelligence are are um part of her self as well as being outside of her so it's sort of um it's there's a dual nature here to those outside influences and the inner influences that that uh, drive her decision making and also her success yeah she she never judged any of them she accepted them for who they were and that's that was her power was that it didn't matter to her whether the scarecrow was was dumb or clever it didn't matter to her if her friends were had a heart or not it was about who they were as friends she accepted them as they were absolutely and i think that's that's also a very important message there is that when we are open and accepting we get the right kind of friends the, the right kind of support network pr presents itself to us on our journey and the wicked people in our lives are the ones that are there to test us to test our resolve to test our ability to overcome obstacles in life and to stick to the straight and narrow path that we were meant to take and also we have to balance up the point that we have we all make choices and some of them are not the best some of them are a little wicked yeah. or a little nasty or very self-centered or mm -hmm. um perhaps they are choices that lead to consequences that are much much bigger like the death of <laughs> the wicked good witch of the east how that would have been a choice i don't know but certainly her choice to listen to the wizard of oz and to actually go and uh challenge the the wicked witch of the west was yeah. was powerful but then she challenges and she had no intention of destroying that witch. Yeah. she felt helpless and Absolutely. yet through some through some uh, luck she managed to overcome the wicked witch of the west but yeah, it was that, through, almost through her goodness rather than her, yeah. her there was no nastiness in it. No. She was like, oh, I'll dump a bu bucket of water on you. I was wondering at the end of last week what the um, implications were if um, Dorothy could get home with her ruby slippers without needing to have gone on that journey to destroy the witch because then the witch died in vain. Okay. The, the witch died for no reason. So there's a journey here and there's an event that was critical because mm. i first thought ah oh, you know that that's weird because the witch didn't need to die but maybe she did yeah 
I would definitely say if we're thinking about the Wicked Witch as our negative self-talk, our doubts and our fears, those definitely have to go. Those have to die for us to be able to reach enlightenment. They have to go for us to be able to be certain in our sense of self. There is also the thing that, as Glinda says at the end of the movies, you would not have believed if you hadn't gone on the journey. And so even if we have, the power resides in us right now to overcome any obstacle, circumstance or situation that we face. But often our belief in that is lacking. We don't believe in our own power. And that is why we have to go on these journeys to discover our power and our worth. I don't know if you have something to add to that. Well, I was thinking that um, that belief in our power or in our, in our inability to perform is also the same belief that, that keeps the, the Wizard of Oz impressing us mm. as this great and terrible, powerful wizard. And right. the, it's actually discovering both that the, the Wicked Witch of the West is, um, is defeatable and that the wizard is actually can be humble that makes all the difference to Dorothy's choices and her ability to get home, to find her way home. Very, very true. I really like that. I want to add one more thing, and that is that the Wicked Witch of the West never goes away. That, that powerful false self-talk that happens will always come up because mm. it's our survival mechanism. It's deeply, deeply entrenched in us from a very, very early age. So what we do have is the choice to identify it, go, I know where that will take me. I know that it will take me the wrong way. It will keep the wizard powerful. Let's go rather to the other alternative, which is to listen to the good witches of the North and the South. Right. And we also have that thing of if we allow the negative self-talk to continue to trap us, we we keep our consciousness stuck in the field of poppies with the eternal slumber where we can, we're stuck and we can never get out. Yes. But there are Absolutely. ways and means to fight that. And one of them is to consciously recognize the wicked witches of our negative self-talk and to say, hang on, you don't have power over me. But there's also well, that aspect well, that our friends it's how does How does she serve you? Because yeah. as soon as you're listening to that negative um, dialogue, and you're tuning into it, if it, how does it serve you is not actually ultimately in your best interest because it tends to push one down into depression and um, lack of self-worth and whatever other, anger, anger is a huge one. Um, anger and fear and frustration, all these uh, terribly negative emotions and then one is, remains stuck. So it's about remaining stuck, it serves you in remaining stuck. So getting through that and getting out of it through compassion and, and forgiveness. Yeah, that that's, leads me to um, thoughts. Sorry for interrupting, but there's... No, that's great. That the depression um, links back to the gray world of the beginning, of Kansas at the beginning. And the other one is that um, Dorothy gets out of that with a little help from her friends. And this is the thing is that our true friends are the ones who will, who will see us through. They, they will be there and they will help us out of those really tight spots where our negative beliefs drag us down. They'll be there to catch us. And we, we can't do these things on our own. This is another, another thing that's really important, I think, is that we can't, we can't defeat the Wicked Witch on our own. We can't make it through the land of Oz, whether good or bad, on our own. We have friends on our journey, and they are very, very important for us to be able to succeed. Right. Wow. So from the gray world to the world of color, 
and back to the gray world, but with a different perspective. Precisely. And with, with a heart ready to transform the lives of those we meet. And imagine the difference for Dorothy, but also for all those people around her because of her understanding and experience. Absolutely. And the brilliance of that, that can be any one of us, that we all have that power and capacity residing within us. It's, it's a very, very beautiful and very deep story. And thank you very, very much for joining me and for talking about this because you've added so much insight to it. I'm just blown away. <laughs> I was blown away listening to you last week and realizing how much more there was to see in this story than I'd ever noticed before. So thank you very much for doing that. That was awesome. And it's been great to be with you this week. Yes. Thank you. It's been absolutely awesome. Thank you for joining me. Before I go, I did want to share something with you because one of my followers made a comment about The Wizard of Oz. They asked me, is this really a fairy tale? And can I actually use it in Fairy Tale Friday? And I thought, you know, at the time I was like, well, hang on, yeah, I know it's a fantasy book, and but it has it has some very important messages. And the way I classify a fairy tale is a perennial story that never grows old, okay, that contains wisdom for our lives. And then I went back and actually read The Wonderful Wizard of Oz and came across the introduction. And this is what Frank Baum has to say. He says, folklore, legends, myths, and fairy tales have followed childhood through the ages. For every healthy youngster has a wholesome and instinctive love for stories fantastic, marvelous, and manifestly unreal. The winged fairies of Grimm and Anderson have brought more happiness to childish hearts than all other human creations. Yet the old time fairy tale having served for generations may now, in 1900, be classed as historical in the children's library. For the time has come for a series of newer wonder tales in which the stereotyped genie, dwarf and fairy are eliminated together with all the horrible and blood curdling incident devised by their authors to point a fearsome moral to each tale. Modern education includes morality. Therefore, the modern child seeks only entertainment in its wonder tales and gladly dispenses with all the disagreeable incident. Having this thought in mind, the story of The Wonderful Wizard of Oz was written solely to pleasure children of today. It aspires to bring a modernized fairy tale in which the wonderment and joy are retained and the heartaches and nightmares are left out. And there you have it. He himself said that this was his version of a fairy tale. So that's it for me for today. I hope you found that interesting. If you would like to add something, you're welcome to leave a comment. I see that Anne has left a comment here. She, she says that Dorothy first overcame her fears, vanquished the Wicked Witch, and then was able to receive the guidance of the Good Witch. Which again, yes, we can't hear the truth if we're constantly listening to our fears. Very brilliant. Thank you, Anne.